following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, how did our country get started? We can honestly say the United States was begun with a prayer meeting. Get the real truth about our nation. People who love the Bible were also leaders in government. And the parts of our history we've tried to forget. A lot of history is about different perspectives. And sometimes history is about trying to piece together what was removed. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Global disasters are unfolding in front of our eyes. Out of Asia, the deadly coronavirus is threatening to become a worldwide pandemic. Earthquakes are erupting in unexpected places. And in Africa, locust swarms of biblical proportions are devouring crops and maybe causing a famine of as many as a billion people. And we look back uh, to uh, Australia uh, last year, there were the worst fires in, in probably the history of our modern age, and one billion animals died. Listen to this from Matthew chapter 24, 7. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. This is the beginning of the sorrows. Senior correspondent George Thomas begins our coverage of these disturbing events. It's almost like a page out of Exodus, the worst outbreak in decades as billions of desert locusts swarm across a large part of Africa. Today, locust swarms are as big as major cities, and this is getting worse by the day. Today, the countries of Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya are facing what experts say is the worst locust infestation in nearly 70 years. Experts say the average swarm can contain up to 150 million locusts, travel 100 miles in a single day, and grow as large as 250 football fields. That swarm in one day can eat the same amount of food as the entire population of Kenya. That swarm in one day can eat the same amount of food as everybody here in the tri-state area. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. Desperate farmers in rural eastern Kenya are using blankets and other clothing or beating on pots and pans to chase away the hungry pests. But it's doing very little to stop them from devouring crops. And now the UN is warning the fast-breeding insects could grow 500 times between now and June. While Africa faces a destructive force of nature, a deadly disease is paralyzing China and shutting down entire cities. As CBN's Dale Hood reports, health officials fear the coronavirus could become a pandemic. Two charter flights carrying 340 Americans from a cruise ship that was quarantined in Japan have landed in the United States. At least 40 Americans who tested positive for coronavirus are staying in Japan. The New York Times reports 14 passengers who were believed to have been well before they were evacuated from the ship were found to be infected before boarding the planes. Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institutes of Health warned that if leaders can't get control of the situation, it will be a pandemic. Technically speaking, the WHO wouldn't be calling this a global pandemic. But it certainly is on the verge of that happening reasonably soon, unless containment is more successful than it is right now. In Jerusalem, rabbis gathered at the Western Wall for special prayers to stop the spread of the coronavirus. The Chinese government claims the number of new cases has dropped to a three-week low, with the death toll set at almost 1,800 and more than 70,000 cases reported worldwide. But is the actual number much, much higher? 760 million Chinese, half the nation's population, is under lockdown. China now admits President Xi was aware of the coronavirus outbreak nearly two weeks before he first spoke publicly about it. And the government was still playing down its dangers. Meanwhile, on this side of the world, signs of the turbulent times are on display as earthquakes shake regions that generally don't see them. 
Puerto Rico was hit with several quakes in late December and in January, a powerful 7.7 .7 quake hit the Caribbean just south of Cuba, rocking that nation as well as Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Just back from Africa is CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas. George, uh, have you got any estimate of uh, how many lives might be lost with famine on account of this locust infestation? Uh, yeah, Pat, and that's the devastating part of, uh, of this tragedy. Uh, caught in the path of the of these swarms, uh, close to about 19 million Africans on the Horn of Africa, as well as further south. Uh, remember, this is a region, Pat, that has already been facing acute uh, food insecurity. This uh, tragedy just uh, conf uh, uh, you know un makes it even worse for the folks living in this part of the region. Countries like uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, they don't have uh, Pat the wherewithal. To, to, to eradicate these locusts. I mean, they have, like, for example, in Zambia, I, I'm sorry, in Kenya, they have three planes that they're using to spray insecticides uh, to try and kill off these, uh, these deadly uh, pests. But uh, they're, they're dealing with a, with a major, major situation. George, some years ago, I was in Zambia with President Chalubu, and he, he just got to be president. And uh, they showed me some agricultural uh, situations that were beautiful. They had the most uh, fat cows, beautiful horses, wonderful lush fields. Now, Zambia is in trouble. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, th yeah, that's right. I was just in the capital city, Lusaka, last weekend, and uh, they are in the middle of a three-year uh, drought. In fact, Zambia is part of some 16 African, southern African countries, Pat, that are dealing with, in some cases, three-year droughts. In other cases, like Zimbabwe, the breadbasket of, of, of southern Africa, a five-year drought. Keep in mind, Pat, the countries of Zambia and South Africa, they produce close to about 70 percent of the grain, the maize in that region, and they have had no rain, little to no rain in the last two years. As I mentioned, I was in Lusaka last week. And Pat, we were dealing with 16 to 17 hours power shortages. There was no electricity. They had this, what they call load shedding. So basically for three hours in the entire 24 hour period, we would have electricity. So very, very difficult situation. Close to 2 million uh, Zambians are in the, in this uh, sort of category of facing acute food uh, insecurity. Well, George, are the locusts hitting Zambia yet, or are they still uh, outside of that area? Uh, no, they're, they're still outside, Pat. I mean, that is the, the concern between uh, March in the eastern part of, uh, of, the, of uh, Africa, as you know, Pat, uh, is the, the harvesting, the planting season. And in the summer is the harvesting season. So uh, the experts are saying that the locusts are, could potentially grow to 500 times uh, bigger uh, in this period between now and June, between between the planting season and the harvest season. So that makes it really, really potentially catastrophic. The, the, the concern is that once they devour all those crops, they will potentially fly further south to countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, Namibia, neighboring Namibia. Uh, folks are really praying, hoping that this doesn't happen. George, one last question. How many millions of people will maybe die from starvation on account of this uh, locust infestation? Yeah, I mean, we, we really don't know yet. I mean, the United Nations has sent out an urgent appeal for close to about $80 million to try to stem this right at the beginning. Look, look at the, heart, the, the, the swarm of locust infestation, kind of like a, a, like a fire pat. You know, the idea is that if there's a wildfire like you saw in Australia, as you mentioned, you want to get it on the front end, not when it is a full-blown wildfire like you saw in Australia. What you're facing right now on the Horn of Africa and in the eastern part of Africa is a full-blown uh, locust uh, infesta uh, infestation. And so these countries are having a very difficult time trying to stop it. The concern is that people will run out of food. Just imagine, as the a, as a, as a person from the Food uh, Agriculture Organization said, this one small, medium-sized swarm of locusts can eat the equivalent of about 35,000 people in one single day. They travel about 100 miles in a single day. One average swarm can contain close to about 150 million uh, locusts. And so the, the threat to livestock, to, to uh, crops, is very, very severe. George, thank you so much. Uh, it's shocking, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I'm not like the... the you know, man, you've seen in the cartoon with uh, Sandals saying the end is here. 
But this does look like it fulfills some of the biblical prophecy, and it's something that we should be alarmed about. But the fact that maybe a billion people might die from starvation, there's not going to be enough food in Africa. All those small plots are going to be eaten up. These locusts are consuming a huge amount of food, and that's just one of the stories. And in other news, wicked weather is wrecking havoc in the south of the United States. Ephraim Graham has more on that. Pat, heavy rains caused rivers to rise in the south with floodwaters threatening homes and property. A landslide plunged a home into the rain-swollen Tennessee River. And in Mississippi, the Pearl River is rising to its highest levels in 37 years, drenching Jackson, the state's capital city. The governor has declared a state of emergency, warning people it will still be days before the area is out of the woods and the floodwaters begin to recede. Want to turn now to the 2020 election. Mike Bloomberg's campaign is neither denying nor confirming a report. He's considering Hillary Clinton as his running mate. The Drudge Report cites its sources close to the campaign, and it published the story on its website Saturday. The Bloomberg campaign released a statement in response to the report saying, we are focused on the primary and the debate, not VP speculation. We now have an early prediction about who could win the Democratic nomination for president. As Jennifer Wishon explains, this method enjoys a time-tested, reliable reputation. What's motivating these Virginia college students to get up early on a cold winter morning? Washington! It's not Abe or even Elvis. Believe it or not, it's presidential politics. Washington and Lee University's mock convention kicks off with a parade of student delegations from each state and U.S. territory. They're preparing to weigh in on the Democratic presidential primary, and if history is any guide, their prediction will be powerful. WNL held its first mock convention in 1908. Since then, students have correctly predicted the nominee 20 out of 26 tries. Held every four years, the prestigious student-run event focuses on the party out of power in the White House. And then we also write a platform, so it's not just picking the nominee, it's predicting the whole convention, pretty much. In 2016, students successfully predicted Trump would win the Republican nomination, but this year has presented unique challenges. With Bloomberg entering the race late and just recently having his you know, vast investment into campaign infrastructure start to really begin to show signs of success, as well as Biden's fall in Iowa and New Hampshire, things are a lot less sure. Wes Culp is on the team that analyzes and adds to months of research compiled by student state chairs. We have not left a single stone unturned. And this year, after all their hard and some might call impossible work, students predict Senator Bernie Sanders will win the top prize, but not until the last second. They project Sanders will enter the national convention just shy of enough delegates to secure the nomination. Due to the crowded field of moderates, they think he'll win enough delegates on a second ballot. The complex process of figuring it all out is eye-opening for students. It's been really fun to get politically active because I'm not politically active um, and learn something or two. I'll be the first person in my family to vote ever in the States. I'm a daughter of immigrants. Um, so that's been really exciting to kind of just learn and do it in a really fun way with my friends. It's been a unique experience where I've been able to kind of divulge and try to figure out, you know, everything that I believe in. I think this organization is so great because it brings everyone on our campus together. We have nine, over 98% of the student body involved. So did they get it right? On to Nevada, South Carolina, Super Tuesday, and beyond to find out. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Lexington, Virginia. Sanders wins the mock convention. We'll see what happens. Pat. Well, you know, I'm a graduate of Washington Lee, and I was involved in one of those things, I believe, trying to think who our candidate was. But each one has a candidate, and there's a team formed. And what the, the, the people do representing that candidate, they call the state. They try to poll all the various um, uh, political figures in that state. They try to take down statistics as to how it looks like their candidate is doing. And, of course, they work and pass out the flyers and things to try to support their own candidates. But when it's all put together, I mean, it's the real goods. And these kids do a very good job of predicting. I'd like to make a little prediction, too. 
in Trump's second term, he is going to be tested severely. I believe that the Chinese are going to test him. I believe that the Russians are going to test him. I believe the North Koreans are going to test him. Certainly, uh, the uh, people in in um, other uh, parts, certainly the, the 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 ones to the south, the uh, have been giving him so much grief so far. He's going to be tested by them, and uh, the Turks are going to test him. So in each testing, he's going to be brought to the point close to war. And if he does not act, he will incite war. If he does act, it will be a shooting war. And I, I just think if there was ever a time to pray for this man, in the second term, it's going to be terrible. And the worst probably is, is Iran. And they, they've now had a war powers resolution trying to limit his power. And he's going to, of course, veto that, and they won't go anywhere. But nevertheless, the Congress is trying to uh, limit his power, but he's going to need all the help he can get. But it's going to happen in the second term. And I, I believe, frankly, it's going to be bringing us to the edge of war. You know, Jesus said there'll be wars and new rumors of wars. There are going to be earthquakes, and, and there are going to be uh, disasters, natural disasters, and there will be famine and uh, pestilence. And I think we've looked at famine and pestilence, and it seems to me, and I don't want to overstate it, but it does seem like we're coming closer than we ever have to some kind of conclusion to this world in which we live. And of course, to those of us who know the Lord, His coming is going to be welcome. So we say, you know, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. But at the same time, you read the Old Testament, and it says, you know, the day of the Lord is going to be a frightful thing. It's going to be a day of gloom and trouble for the nations. And so our world is getting to be rocked. But as the Bible says, don't let your heart be troubled, or neither let it be afraid. Have I not told you these things? The Lord has got the world under control, so do not be afraid. Amen. Okay. Amen. It's his pleasure to give his children the keys to the kingdom. Right? <laughs> right. Well, it's President's Day, and we've got a history lesson that you won't learn in schools. Which of our founding fathers said, quote, our country needed to follow Christ? And who was also president of the American Bible Society? You'll get the answers coming up. Plus, history comes alive even as it shocks the onlookers. How are people telling the controversial stories of our past? Find out when we return. Who said this quote, we needed to follow Christ or we're never going to succeed as a nation. That was the founder of our nation first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, George Washington. And today on President's Day, we honor him and other American presidents. And as Paul Strand reports, their Christian faith helped to shape this greatest nation on the face of the earth. In locations all around colonial Philadelphia, founders who knew the God of liberty fought to form a nation of liberty. The Providence Forum's founder says George Washington personified this. Washington said we needed to follow Christ or we're never going to succeed as a nation. That was not a minister. That's not a right-wing conservative fundamentalist. That's the father of our country. The founders were overwhelmingly of the Christian faith following Jesus Christ, a carpenter. And what's interesting is when they first met as a Congress, it was here in a place called Carpenter's Hall. Here in 1774, they wanted to unite against Britain, but were divided by both denomination and regional customs, like Adams meeting Washington. John Adams comes up to shake his hand and George Washington steps back because Virginians don't shake hands. You know, they give a bow. You might wonder how America began. Did it begin with a rebellion, bloodshed? Well, actually it began here in Carpenter's Hall with prayer. Though that seemed almost impossible. But all the different denominations believed that the others were wrong and they couldn't fellowship with them. And this is the great accomplishment of Samuel Adams, called the spark plug of the American Revolution, who said, I'm no bigot. I can pray with any man who loves his God and loves his country. 
and he backed that up in Carpenter's Hall. Adams, a Congregationalist, chose a minister as prayer leader from a church diametrically opposed to his, the Anglican Jacob Duche. And so he comes, Book of Common Prayer, leads in prayer, and he does it in the name of Jesus Christ. So we can honestly say the United States was begun with a prayer meeting. As the Revolutionary War began, these colonials did great things in a new location. The Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution began right there inside Independence Hall. From there, the Continental Congress in 1776 sent Thomas Jefferson out to come up with the Declaration. Working nearby, he put together those famed words about life and liberty, but also against slavery. Jefferson, although a slave owner, realized that they were making the world over again. They said something unique is happening here. And he said, we need to end slavery. It went to the Congress, and we we're told while it was being debated, Jefferson was fuming in the corner because there's some 88 changes that were made to his document. One of those changes was taking out Jefferson's idea to wipe out slavery. Still, opponents of the practice wouldn't give up, pointing out the Liberty Bell scripture from Leviticus. Doesn't that old bell say proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof? And this became the great icon of the abolitionist assault against slavery. And they're the ones that named it the Liberty Bell. Meanwhile, at the 1787 Constitutional Convention in Independence Hall, the founders accepted the Bible saying, all men are sinners and in their depravity can't be trusted. Like when it came to representatives from large states, insisting the small states didn't need equal power in the new nation's Congress. And the representative of the big state says, don't worry, we'll take care of you. And the little state representative says, we don't trust you. We believe in political depravity. And they said, we need a way that will check your power. And so a bicameral system was created. Then the new U.S. Senate and House of Representatives started meeting here, neither able to pass anything without the other. On the other side of Independence Hall, Chief Justice John Jay presided over the first Supreme Court. And he also turns out to be uh, a president of the American Bible Society. So we see that people who love the Bible were also leaders in government. Like Washington, who refused to give up in the bitter cold of Valley Forge and later refused to take a crown. Some people say Washington is the greatest man in Western civilization for the two things he didn't do. He didn't quit when all was lost and he didn't become king when all was won. And in doing both, he was following the very character of Christ who persevered to accomplish his mission and only did it in the right way. You can visit the ProvidenceForum.org's self-guided faith and freedom tour and see for yourself how the Lord, his liberty, and this land all fit together. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Philadelphia. Thanks, Paul. The so-called progressive of the a radical left has tried to eliminate all of those things from our teaching, from our schools, from our uh, public uh, life. But that's the way it is, and that's where we came from. And we need on this Founders Day and for every other day to recognize that our liberties spring from the fact that we believe that we are created in the image of God. And those liberties spring from a creator, not from the government. The Russian Constitution basically says your liberties come from the state. Our liberties do not come from the state. The state comes from us, from free people getting together to vote in their uh, elected officials, not the other way around. And those early founders had it right. And just could imagine the first Supreme Court justice, the, ch the chief of the Supreme Court, John Jay, was also head of the American Bible Society. Can you imagine what's been done as you, you look at the hearings that are held for uh, Supreme Court judges? Well, do you believe in abortion? Do you believe in uh, your radical view of marriage? Do you believe in this, that, and the other? And if somebody says, I believe in the Bible, the next Supreme Court justice who is coming up, I think, is a lady, and her views were hammered away in, in some hearing that it was held as she was being considered for a circuit court judge. Uh, the, the, the views that she believed in the Bible, believed in God. I mean, but this is the way we started, and we cannot surrender those things. All right, Terry? That's what made us the unique country we Amen. are. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Right. Well, up next, rewriting the history books. These researchers are telling the untold truths about our country. What have they discovered, and how does our past change our nation today?
Liberty for all. That was the basis for the American Revolution. But it took another century for that dream to be realized. Slavery is a painful part of our past. And after museums and historical sites tried to hide it for so long, the stories of those in bondage are now finally being told. Behind libraries, museums are the most trusted institutions in America. And that's an incredible amount of responsibility. Every year, millions flock to America's museums and historical sites for a taste of the American experience. Visitors connect with places, stories, and people of the past, often with the help of historical interpreters. The job of an interpreter is to help you see your history and then to give you a context to then think through it to, to provoke you to want to know more or to think about it in a different way. The push to preserve America's historical sites began in the early 20th century. As well-intentioned as that was, America's early triumphs and founders took center stage, relegating an ugly truth to the sidebar of history, slavery. People come to historic sites and they think, well, this is how it was. If you don't see slavery, then you can pretend like it wasn't there. And I think that was very much the case for historic sites in the early 20th century. And everybody who works here, everybody knew that that was a problem. As the civil rights movement fought to expose racial injustice, historians also began digging deeper into African-Americans' role in building this country. They were here just 12 years after the English arrived. They were part of that beginning. The slave trade in English North America potentially began in 1619, when enslaved West Africans were brought by the Portuguese to Jamestown, Virginia. But little was known about the population growth until data discovered in the 1950s shed some light that by the start of the Revolutionary War, over half the population of Williamsburg, Virginia, one of America's first major cities, was black. That was a revelation to the researchers here. And they started saying, there's a whole half of the population that we are not representing at all. A lot of history is about different perspectives, and sometimes history is about trying to piece together what was removed. At historical sites throughout the country, great efforts were made to expose the reality of enslavement. But the facts alone, again, painted an incomplete picture. Missing were the stories of real people, their lives, and their viewpoints. If you try to say that, that this is about a slave, they become a statistic. We heard those statistics growing up in school, and it's really easy to take a statistic and just put it over to the side. Coming to a place where your ancestors were literally enslaved here, it can be painful. As a black kid growing up, I was never taught to, um, to love my history. It was always meant to be shameful. It was always meant to be something that we whispered about. The emphasis on oppression, though very much a reality, meant another truth was still untold, that black Americans have just as much claim to founding this country as anyone. You can't truly have the American story if you don't have each and every one of those voices contributing to it. In the past 40 years, many historic sites and museums have taken bold approaches to telling the full story of America's beginnings. When we look at a program, it's not a program about slavery, but it's a program about people. At Colonial Williamsburg, interpreters portray historical figures from the time, including enslaved and freed African Americans. Stephen Seals plays James Lafayette, an enslaved man who won his freedom by serving as a revolutionary war spy. When people see and experience something, it helps you to be more open to taking in what's going to happen before you can really start to have those really, really deep conversations. But visitors aren't the only ones affected. Steven admits that, 
At first, he was disheartened by his character's history until a black colleague gave him a new perspective. Don't lower your head. Hold your head up high. The story of slavery is not a story of, of defeat. It is not a story of shame. It is a story of survival, about all of these people that survived long enough for you to be sitting here today able to tell their story, and you should be proud of that. Christy Coleman says telling the story accurately means taking some chances. Sometimes that work is difficult. Sometimes that work is emotional. But at the end of the day, it's all enlightening. And it builds, I think, an important empathy, which sometimes it feels like we're missing that. Christy was an interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg. In 1994, she and her colleagues decided to reenact a slave auction live. The announcement sparked international controversy on all sides of the issue. There were all kinds of uh, presumptions about what the program was actually going to be. Everything from having people half naked, allowing visitors to touch them and what happened, allowing visitors to bid on, it was just nonsense. They were expecting it to be this really just screaming and visceral and just, and it's not, except for the people that are experiencing it, who are being sold off, who are trying to be strong or can't be. And that to me is what's the most powerful about this. And turn the tide during the middle of it to make people go, you're right, this is a story that needs to be told. I wanted to do this so that each and every one of you never forget what happened to them. And stage and slave auction. Gentlemen, do I have all in this very valuable slave? Well-skilled in attending to the needs of his master, Mr. Prentice wins the bid at 70 pounds. Other sites were also taking bold action. In 1993 at Monticello, the home of founding father and slave owner Thomas Jefferson, historians started the Getting Word Oral History Project and began tours about slavery. Both initiatives share real-life stories passed down by the enslaved to their families. What we're doing here is putting back in the historical record people whose lives were diminished and dismissed and giving them the value that they earned in their lifetimes but weren't allowed to demonstrate. Then in 1998, DNA testing proved a centuries-old rumor that Thomas Jefferson had fathered children with an enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. Gail Jessup White is one of their hundreds of descendants. Enslavement, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, separated and destroyed families. It happened in my own family. Thanks to getting word and the efforts here, the descendants of those broken families have been brought back together. The Civil War was one of America's most divisive times. After the war, museums were founded to tell stories of the battlefield and the generals who led each side. Today, the American Civil War Museum tells a much more detailed story that includes the voices of enslaved and free African Americans. As the museum's former CEO, Christy Coleman guided its 2019 launch. When we have that fuller narrative to me, it enables us to see the present that we're living in, to answer the questions that we have. We're half-stepping it. We're not giving ourselves all of the tools to address the challenges that face our nation. Behind the tireless work at all of these sites, there's a fundamental goal, that through a thorough understanding of our shared past, we can overcome the issues that divide us today. I want all of us to feel and to function as one people as Americans. We can no longer afford convenient or and or half-truths. We can no longer afford a indoctrination narrative versus a really thoughtful consideration of the past. I genuinely believe that we will never get right with each other until we get our history right. 
And here's one of the reasons it's so important that we do. Scripture says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands a blessing. We want and we need His blessing in the hour we live in. Well, still to come, a desperate search for water, and the only source this family could find was filthy and five hours away. Who came to their rescue? We'll tell you. And then later, another round of your questions and some honest answers. Linda says, my five-year-old grandson asked me about communion. How do you explain such a graphic biblical story to a child? Pat's going to tackle that and more, so stay with us. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Rains postponed the Daytona 500 NASCAR race Sunday. The race is scheduled to run at 4 p.m. today. President Trump served as Grand Marshal this year, telling the crowd no matter who wins the race, what matters most is God, family, and country. The president was greeted by enthusiastic fans with Trump 20 flag, 2020 flags in the infield. CBN recently celebrated the 2000th episode of the 700 Club Canada. The Daily Show started broadcasting in 2011 and airs on national television, the internet, and social media. Hosted by Brian Warren and Lori Harshawn, this dynamic program reaches audiences throughout Canada with a mix of social news, ministry, interviews, and feature stories. The program receives thousands of viewer responses each month. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Five hours a day, every day. That's what it took for a mother in Kenya to find water. What's worse, when she found it, the water was filthy, and drinking made her whole family sick. Purity is her mother's little shadow. She follows her around everywhere she can. But each day, her mother left their mud hut and walked long distances on her own to fetch water. It took me five hours every day to bring home dirty water that made us sick. Elephants and other animals defecated in the water. Because of the elephants, I also walked my daughters to and from school. It took so long, I could not work. At times, it was hard to find and prepare food. Then Operation Blessing built a preschool close to their home and invited Purity to attend. She and all the children here received free meals and a good education. I love coming to school with my friends. There are so many things to play with. I eat vegetables and rice until my stomach is very full. We learn about Jesus too. He loves in my heart and we pray to him every day. We dug a well at the school so Purity's mother no longer walks long distances to fetch dirty water. We also gave their family one goat, two chickens and vegetable seeds. Operation Blessing gave us classes on how to start small businesses. My goat multiplied and later became 10 goats. I planted tomatoes and sold them too. With all the money I made, we built a timber home and moved out of our mud hut. So from one goat and a couple chickens and some seeds, they were able to multiply that and build a house. That's amazing, that's a, that's a success story. Our lives are completely different now. My husband and I still grow vegetables and raise goats. We sell the goat milk to make even more money. We have enough to provide our children with all their needs. I thank God for sending you into our lives. May God enlarge your territories and may you continue to help others. Isn't that wonderful? You know, again, there's seven billion people or so in the world. We can't help them all, but we sure can do it one at a time. And they're one after one after one after one. And there's one and then the husband and the wife and then the children and they have children. And the next thing you know, it spreads all over the world. 
And that's what the Lord wants. But if you consider the poor, God will consider you. He'll look after you. And it's been our joy to do this. So you can join the 700 Club and help us help others like that wonderful family there in Kenya who needed help so badly. Just thank you if you were in a situation like that. Well, we've lifted them out of that poverty, and they now have a joyous opportunity. They're, they're, they have a business. I mean, think of that. People are very creative. They just need a few tools. So we've given it to them. <clears throat> you can be a 700 Club member. What have you got to do? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you can be a 700 Club member. 1-800-700-7000. Just call in and say you can count on me. And if you want to do a lot more, we'd be glad to receive it. Now, <clears throat> there's something I want to do for you. When you join the 700 Club, I want to give you this book I've written. It's called Seven, Ten Laws of Success, Keys to Win Work, Family, and Finance. And this book is available to you. And by the way, I want to add that if you want extra copies, you could look at Amazon and you can pick them up on Amazon. And uh, it's a real wonderful book. It just gives all these keys. You can read it over and over again. It's available, but it's available on Amazon. Just, you know, you just, just actually, if you want extra copies, and I hope you do. Terry? It is one of those books that you want to read over and over again. Yeah. I underlined mine. Yeah. So go to the, the key points. But I want to tell you what Margaret from Martinsville, Virginia said. Ten Laws for Success is a powerful testimony about a life wholly lived for God. I feel so blessed to have received a copy. And then she says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're going to love this book, too. And it's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. It's our way of saying thank you for caring about other people when they're in need. So, Amen. Yes, Amen. Give us a call. Well, well, President's Day is something you can do. Just pick up the phone, call Amazon, and say, I want a copy of 10 Laws of Success. And it's in Kindle. I don't know how they do these books, but anyhow, it's out there for you. <laughs> They'll but, tell you when well, you We'll call. send this to you for, <laughs> with your pledge. And if you want extra copies, that's where you can get them. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, still ahead, Pat's <laughs> going to weigh in on the issues that matter to you. Kimberly asks, is it okay if I pay my tithe to a church on TV? You're about to find out, so don't go away. Well, it promises to be an inspiring experience. I Am Patrick hits the big screen for two nights, March the 17th and the 18th, and yes, right in time for St. Patrick's Day. Our last Fathom event played to packed out theaters, so you're going to want to get your ticket early. Go to IamPatrick.com. You can buy your tickets today, and we suggest that you do that. This is a Reminder to me, I'm off to my computer when we're done here yeah. so I can buy my own. <laughs> okay. Time for some email. We've got your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Linda who says, my five-year-old grandson came across our communion fellowship cups and asked what they were. To say the least, I was at a loss. How do you tell a five-year-old that Jesus was brutally beaten, shed his blood, and had his body broken for his, the five-year-old's, and the world's salvation and healing? And this is what we do to remember him for it. How do you make a five-year-old understand? Well, the first thing you do is to stop being so complicated. Good yes. grief. How do you expect it? You say, this shows about the Lord Jesus, then how come you and I are going to heaven? And this is an evidence that as we share in this together, we're going to share with him in eternity. And you can say, you know, he had to die in order for us to live. And don't go into all that glory stuff. I mean, a five-year-old? I mean, who, who? You know, the trouble with people is they want to complicate everything. And God wants to simplify your life. Amen. And I really believe, <laughs> so try to make it simple. And then when he gets older, you start adding to it. But that's, you don't go into all that. Okay, what's next? This is Kimberly who says, I haven't gone to church in a long time. I want to pay my tithes. Is it okay if I pay my tithes to churches on TV? Will I go to hell if I don't join a church? Uh, the Bible says that Abraham beat up on the kings when he went to deliver his nephew from uh, the king of Sodom. And he won a victory. And when he got through, he was met by a man named Melchizedek, which means the uh, uh, king of righteousness and the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And the Bible says 
Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tithe of everything he had. Now, that is the foundation. We are to give tithes where we are blessed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible also was talking about when there was a temple set up in, in Israel, a great big temple, then the people were told to bring their tithes to the temple where they were. But the preceding, the way beyond that, you give to where you're blessed. And if you have made a commitment to a local church, but you say, I'm going to put my tithes in the storehouse, but that's, that's way after Abraham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's the commandment. So if you're blessed, you can do that. But I really think that you know, if you have a commitment to a local church, then then you are part of the of the fellowship, and and you you want to give them the, the, your support. So, but anyhow, that, that's the rule. All right. Mm -hmm. This is Letty who says the second commandment says, "Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image." That's Exodus twenty, uh, verse four. Does that mean we should not have images or statues of Jesus or wear crosses as jewelry? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. And again, uh, you you go back. And you see, what is the Lord is, is Yahweh, and uh, He is He who causes everything to be. You shall not make any image of Yahweh for vanity. So the idea is you're not going to take a, a statue of, of, of the God who is uh, the creator of all the earth and, and try to make a statue of it and then give it a name. That's, that's what He shall not make you know, for vanity shall not take the name of the Lord thy God. And, and, and graven images are the same thing. So, but I, I think the idea that you can have some saint and set him up and you can uh, rub his toes or something like that, I think that's idolatry and I don't think we ought to have that. Um, but um, I don't think that it says you, you can't have a cross or, or wear certain jewelry, but the idea is you don't take the name of the Lord and, and make it into something else. And you don't set up graven images uh, and try to make believe they are like the God you serve, okay? This is Jonathan who says, Hi, Pat, I'm inspired by what you eat and cook. Have you ever thought about writing a cookbook? I think it would be a bestseller. Uh, you're very kind. I've thought and dismissed the idea right now. <laughs> <laughs> it came and went, yeah. just like a vapor. I tell you, I'm in the middle of right now writing a book about the Holy Spirit. It's the most exciting thing. And I've just finished one about how I walk with the living God, 90 years of walk with God. And, uh, you know, in all seriousness, I've got books that I hope will change the lives of people all around the world. And I don't want to do it with a cookbook, but I'm a pretty good cook, and I have had some wonderful things. My my minestrone is legendary, <laughs> and my age-defining defining pancakes are simply superb. But I'm not going to write a cookbook. But thanks for <laughs> saying it. All right. Pat, this is Teresa who says, Hi, Pat. I am a single woman about to pay off my mortgage on my home at the end of this year. I want to move out of my state. I heard you say to pay off all your debt the other day on your program. Would you think it unwise for me to start a new mortgage in a new state? Illinois is taxing me to death on my fixed income. I have no other debt. All right. The idea is, do you want to leave your state because it's high tax? By all means, if that's what you feel like doing. As far as paying off your mortgage, it has to do with how much you're spending. I mean, can you get a better deal? I mean, if you're paying like 7% uh, on your mortgage and you can get one at 3%, mm -hmm. well, by all means, refi. There's nothing wrong with that uh, it, it, to get a better deal. But as far as leaving the state, that, that's, that's a different matter. That's up to you between you and the Lord. Well, we leave you with our power minute for the book of Matthew. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, it's been so nice being with you. Tomorrow we've got 25 years in jail for a crime he didn't commit. What piece of paper set him free? Tomorrow's show, so for Terry and me, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye.